destination I'm I'm on my way to glory you, you go into the store to get a gallon of milk nope I'm on my way to glory Amen. thank the Lord amen bless the Lord well hallelujah we're glad to be amongst hallelujah people in the name of Jesus our Lord so let's just dedicate this service in prayer we might add to the prayer request just remember Brother Terry, Sister Carol for their uh, trip upcoming next weekend, flight to Florida, and, and uh, be down there for the best part of a couple weeks there. So so we're just praying for a good visit down there and, and safe return home on the other side of things. Amen. Wherever it is we go, whether it's Florida or across the street, we're on our way to glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's, so let's just pray. Thank you, Father, for your eternal presence being among us, Lord. We thank you, Father. We always pray that we be found within your will. For it's not our will be done, but it's your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. And then we know that you withhold no good thing from those that walk uprightly. For you are the God of the upright, the God of Jeshurun, Father. So just uh, be amongst us and bless us as we... Uh, ascribe greatness to our God, for truly you are great. How great thy goodness is. Oh, how great thou art. Oh, blessed Lord. We just thank you, Father, for the faith that sustains us and gives us life through the name of Jesus in which we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank the Lord. Bless the Lord. He's good to us. Amen. Thank the Lord. Well, it's time to turn off the darkness. Amen. By singing, He took me from the power of darkness. Thank you, Jesus. Separated from the world by the message that I heard, by revelation and knowledge. Translated 
says it's the Lord above. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for being part of that word, for being part of the calling that leads to greater glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated this time. Brother Bill comes forward. We just thank the Lord for words of praise that are inspired from the Lord above. Amen. Brother Bill. Would you? Um, Brother Ryan was talking about the choices and how the saints yeah. in Scripture um, made these choices. And that's kind of what the song is based on. But um, and I was actually practicing it and singing it last night. Amen. And I just thank said, okay, I guess I am supposed to do it. So Amen. thank the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Would you open up the door to let Jesus in? Would you hold out your hand? walk with him would you take up the cross and follow the king would you stand before him and know it was he and what will you do Desolation 
Would you sacrifice your life as he did for me? Would you draw him water, give him a drink? Would you have him dine in as your guest? Would you give your last tithing and offer it to him? just if it's okay really quickly um you know the lord's given me great opportunity lately <laughs> to share of his goodness to share of his love and what his love is um there's been lots of reconciliation in my life um and for those i love and i can't thank him enough for his goodness and his mercies and um I'm just thankful for the opportunity and the open doors that he gives to share of his goodness and his love. So Amen. thank the Lord. Amen. Beautiful. God bless you, Sister Rachel. You know, God said the rocks, if we didn't praise God, the rocks would instantly cry out. So thank God he, he helps us to do that in all glory to him. Amen. For our next selection, Sister Carol and Sister Patty will sing for us, Jesus, you're my liberty.
but the devil is bound Cause I put senses down And now I'm free Jesus, you're my liberty Your word is alive within me To give me life more abundantly Jesus, you're my liberty. No longer bound to live by the world and their opinions of me. We have a messenger who preaches the faith of Jesus to heal. He shows me how to be strong and to overcome fear and when i hear this preaching by revelation i know his will because christ gets in me in every fiber every bone every cell jesus you are my strength I'll give you room in this body, a flesh to perform your miracles. Jesus, you are my strength, and by your word, nothing is impossible. I can do all things. The word. Receive all my needs before I see. My spirit believes the supernatural and brings it to pass in me. I confess all the power, the faith that it takes to act as his son. I cooperate with him in the spirit till every battle is won. Jesus, you're my victory. My faith knows no bounds. I can reach greater heights in thee. Jesus, you're my victory. I know your presence within me Let's loose all the power you gave to me I know your presence within me Let's loose all the power you gave to me Amen. God bless you, Sister Patty, Sister Carol, and Sister Miriam on the piano. For our next selection, the sisters will sing for us. There's a word seed that's been planted. That never will depart One has planted, one has watered But as God gives the increase First the root must be established That the fruits will manifest It's been planted in a faith field And watered by God's love the husband is my father who came down from above. It's a life that's everlasting. It's a life that's not my own. We'll abide within his presence till the 
no matter what may try, Christ's imperishable word see. Now as he lives, so shall I. There's a word seed that's been planted deep within my heart, and it's growing love of Jesus that never will depart. One has planted, one has watered, but it's God gives the increase. First the root must be established, then the fruits will manifest. It's been planted in a faith field, and it's watered by God's love. For the husbandman's my father, who came down from above. Just really quick, um, this is a song Sister Margo wrote in 1979, and um, still true today. I mean, it's just amazing how that com keeps coming back around, and we really miss you, Sister Margo. <laughs> Well, last selection, we will sing Holy Forever.
is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. your sisters, Sister Mimma on the piano, and Brother Orwell. And if we'll all stand before Pastor Ryan comes to bring forth the word of truth unto us this evening, we will sing on page 128 in the blue book, Redemption's Strong Enough. Redemption's Strong Enough Redemption strong enough. It's strong enough to heal the sickest man. Redemption strong enough. Redemption strong enough. It's strong enough to fall the devil's plan. Now the world is full of darkness and the people full of understand how strong that sin must be. But Jesus came as Savior to destroy our enemy. Do you understand how strong the blood can be? Redemption strong enough. Redemption strong enough. It's strong enough to heal the Redemption strong enough, redemption strong enough, it's strong enough to spoil the devil's plan. Now the world is full of darkness, and the people full of sickness, do you understand how strong that one can be? 
Jesus, same as Savior, to destroy our enemy. Do you understand how strong the blood can be? Redemption strong enough. Redemption strong enough. It's strong enough to cleanse the sinner man. Redemption strong enough. enough to spoil the devil's plan. Redemption strong enough, redemption strong enough, it's strong enough to heal the sickest man. Redemption strong enough, redemption strong enough, it's strong enough to spoil the devil's As we seek unto our God and praise his holy name, Sister Miriam plays through as we listen to the refrains of the chorus. Father, we truly are thankful that your redemption is strong enough. You paid the price there at Calvary, Father, and that speaking blood paid every price, paying for a debt that you did not owe, but we owed it, and you paid it for us. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord, that we can be found within your word within your will let the light of the gospel shine down upon us father to lift us up into heavenly places in christ jesus lord being put at the same table we're at that same table of communion that was there when you shared father before the cross and you'll get us to the supper amen even that supper the wedding supper of the lamb where we're seated at your table once more so father we just thank you for the word that gets us there in Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen and amen. Well, hallelujah. Hallelujah and amen. Bless the name of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, glory. Amen. Glory for another day of worship. That's right. Amen. December demands that it be a little less temperate out there, but uh, we thank the Lord that the roadways are clear and that we can gather together in, in the worship house and in the fellowship room in between and, and here once again to praise the Lord's name. So Lord, make his glories just to rest upon each and every one of us this day and on into this evening as God's glory it shows amen it shines in the light of day even as it does when it pierces the shadows of the darkness but it's always a good time to turn off some more of the darkness in Jesus name as ever even as it was when the darkened void could not comprehend the light of St. John chapter 1 and verse 5 and those bright glimpses of glory that we get those glimpses of scripture, they sustain us, even as it was for the apostles there on the mount when Jesus' face was transfigured before them, did shine like the sun. And for the time being, we see that moment by faith, but that's getting us prepared for greater glories which are to come. Amen. As we're looking forward to the time when time shall be no more. And things are eternal, and we'll see, not only will we see him as he is, but the light of his presence will make it light round about us there in 1 John 3, 2. We'll see him as he is. What all that will entail and what all that includes to see him as he is, that's an awesome thought. I, to comprehend that with my mental capacity, that's, that's, a, that's a tough one. But I know it means at least this, we'll see God as he is, as an all-surrounding presence of light. Amen. And then God can manifest himself in whatever way that he chooses. But he will be light himself, for God is light, even as he is love. 
even as God is wisdom, even as God is truth. He is all those things. So God showed himself that wisdom and light and love and truth. He showed himself in Christ so that he could show himself to all. And that was the idea behind the whole thing. That was the plan, the blueprint of the ages. And uh, that's what we have our sights set upon in this title, which is Pressing On. I'm pressing on to that city. If only we had a song like that. We could <laughs> sing at the end of service. Hmm. Somebody come up with one to see, see if we can do that. All right. Pressing on to that city where mansions are prepared for me, because that's the place prepared. Uh, in my father's house, or in other words, in my father's kingdom, there are many mansions. And those are prepared. And pressing on, that's a, it's a very simple subject, of course, but, yet, but that doesn't mean we can't say some profound things within a very simple subject. And it's vital to the inward being as we make our pilgrimage to a better place, a place whose builder and maker is God. Amen. And what a promise it is. It makes us to press toward the mark of the high calling in Christ to reach the journey's end. And then it, and then after all that, it gets even better. So amen. We've got a lot to look forward in Jesus' name. We, need, uh, we all need to satisfy the longings of our heart, to have something to look forward to. People do that all the time during the work week. What do they do? They look forward to the weekend. But, uh, you know, it's also the passing of years and your time on earth. Well, we're pressing toward something, toward an expected end that has no end. That's, right. That's eternal. Amen. amen. So we're looking forward to that which is eternal, does not pass away. We're looking forward to that which has got us here, amen, what was. Uh, right now we deal with what is, but we're looking forward to what is to come in Jesus' name. And it gives us something to satisfy our soul. It gives us something prophetic to center upon uh, in those things which are ahead, which the Lord knows we need. You just... It, every person feels the need to look ahead to the promise of a brighter day. So, the, the hope of better things to come. It's briefly comprehended, the, the, the scripture, it's found in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 9, uh, that says, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn or the grain as they threshed and, and uh, produced the flour that comes from the grain. Well, Paul states there that for our sakes, this no doubt was written. That's for us. It's a commandment directly. It looks like just something to regulate the animal kingdom. But it's also for us, uh, as well as the beast of burden, the old ox needs some hope that he gets to munch a little uh, bit of the grain or the corn as he turns the wheel. That's a hope to him. Uh, but it's written for us because he that ploweth should plow in hope. Yeah. Just as the ox labors and uh, gets a bit of uh, reward as he turns the wheel. So prophecy is given to us to give us hope as we look to the future that is ahead of us. And the newness of life in Christ is such a hope. Makes uh, one to be forward thinking in their outlook, which again, that's an instinct that's just native to our makeup as human beings. We need that. And it makes us to think in future terms uh, in prophecy. Sure, that's obvious. But not in just that alone. It has good effect in the here and the now, in the, the present tense that we go through, in all manner of ways and thoughts. It's just a, uh, a character trait of fine gold that the sovereign Lord puts into the heart of believers everywhere. Yeah. As our gospel is one of the future. It's all future in Christ. What am I looking forward to? The future. There are many things within that future, just as there are many mansions within the house, within the kingdom of the Almighty God, but it's all future in Christ. So, full speed ahead in Jesus' name as we look to these things. And uh, biblically, you know, you can look back and you can find the future when we look at what is. You're, you're seeing the future that's set in types and examples that lead to the glorious of, uh, future of what is to come. Uh, through those types and examples of old, they establish a better covenant to come 
in their foreshadowings and in their parallels of the word that set down the foundations before us in the showing and in the telling of ages to come, even to that world without end phrase in scripture, which is the land that has no end because it's the land of promise. It's the Beulah land of the happy marriage located in the country of Hephzibah, the delightful country of the Almighty God. They're found in Isaiah 62 and verse 4, and that's wonderful. It's wonderful how the, the scripture is, is outlined and it's detailed. It's so uh, exacting in its precious promises. But just even in general terms, uh, the Bible's written about one-third of the uh, Bible to the looking ahead in prophetic terms. And uh, indeed, all scriptures uh, perform that function of looking ahead in one way or another, from either directly or in positions of support, whether they're doctrinal or historic, they all look ahead. They look ahead to Christ. And for us who are here in 2,000 years, uh, roughly from the birth of Christ to that which uh, happened on the cross and then the resurrection, by the foundations of looking back to the truths that have been before us, it helps us to look ahead to the future. And it's all one work. It's all designed to do one purpose, to get you to Christ, to get you to the cross at Calvary, which is the focal point of the book from Genesis 1-1, from that beginning, to the Revelation 22-21 ending. And all points in between, they bring you to Christ. And then and there at the ending, amen, it's punctuated with our great big old amen. amen. Which means that he is faithful and true and certain. Yeah. Always has been, is now, always will be the spirit of truth and holiness. Amen covers a lot of ground. You're saying a lot. The great I am said a lot in that amen. phrase with two words born out of three letters. I am, boy, that says everything. Amen says a lot. You're covering a lot of spiritual territory there in the blood of Jesus as it covers a lot uh, of territory and makes reconciliation for sins. Truly, redemption strong. It's strong enough to meet the test in, in every way, shape, or form. And love, such as was displayed at Calvary, Love covers a multitude of sins. And in the, uh, the eternal one, within his spirit, in his wisdom, he came up with a way to express every bit of that in a body of flesh, the word that dwells among us. And I've never said it too much. No one else has either. You put all the sermons together from the New Testament era right on down to our present age, it's never been said too much. God has never been magnified nor glorified too much. There are times to just be still and know that I am God. But taking it all together when we come together and praise his name, thank the Lord it has good effect. And there's always more to know. There's always more to be revealed and more to glorify God for. Let's glorify his holy name by reading out of the Holy Scripture of Truth in the book of Philippians, church at Philippi on the... Greek Peninsula there as Paul established the early church. The message to the Philippians, we'll read from chapter 3. It's been a long fight for the Christian church to establish truth. Boy, has it ever. So much injustice done, so many false ideas. So many trappings of the enemy, so many weaknesses of the flesh. Been a long fight to establish justice and equity in the world. But you know what? The fight's a good one. Yeah. It's a good fight. It's the fight of faith. It exercises our faith within. And Paul's heart of faith will show here is uh, what a miracle. It's a persecutor now turned proclaimer. Now, you know, a carnal mind would think, well, yeah, if, God, if I'm on the road to Damascus or somewhere, you know, and pick a place in Ogler Lee County, you know, in our area that we live in. Uh, if God speaks to direct, directly to me, yeah, I'd probably turn around too. But you know something? There's more to it than that. 
Paul had a zealousness for the truth, but it was misdirected because of the traditions of the elders and, and so forth. But it, it, it does this. When Saul of Tarsus got turned around, it shows how great God's forgiveness is. It, it showed upon the cross, it showed in the conversion of Paul, that he would have mercy upon this one. And it's a sign to all those that no matter, even if you're a persecutor of the church, your life can be turned around in the moment, in the blink of an eye, if faith is there. So Paul himself, he counts, as we read, he, he's at a place where he counts all former things as lost. He, he just wants to lose it all. It's all gone. In order to gain the excellency of the knowledge of Christ and to know his resurrection. So in Philippians chapter 3, we're going to be at the 13th verse. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. In other words, I, I don't have it all. I'm still pressing ahead. I'm still pressing on. There are things to be gained. Now this is, at this point, his doctrine has been upgraded. He's been on the learning curve. He's, he knows a lot, but he knows he's not all the way there yet. I, I don't have it all yet. I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, because what, what do you do when you get baptized? You bury the past. You bury the past. It's gone. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I'm pressing on. Amen. I have the determination to do that because I, I've got some knowledge from on high. So I pre, at verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, God. Well, what a prize is set before us. Can you think about that? Is that selfish? Not only must you believe that God is, but you must believe he's a, a rewarder of the diligent seeker. So going after the great prize, the pearl of great price that you give all you have to obtain it, there's nothing self-centered about that. That's there for the taking for each and every one of us. All of us together. So I press toward that mark. Verse 15. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, in other words, perfect, perfectly forgiven because Paul he, he was no standard of perfection in his personal life but now he's got turned around God's mercy is shown upon him as many as be perfectly forgiven which he was that he was perfect in that sense still as human as anybody else but now he's perfectly forgiven as many as are covered by the blood of Jesus or as many as be perfect in that way be thus minded and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. God will show you. He'll help you. Thank you Lord. He's with you. Just, you. just press on toward the mark. All right, verse 16. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. That which we have, take it, grab a hold of it, share it with others. And then press toward the mark of that high calling. So, and if you're going to do one thing in this world, let it be this. Get a hold of Christ or apprehend him. Apprehend Christ in the sense that the King James Version uses it here in, in these scriptures. As a, it was the Lord. Saul of Tarsus, boy, he had a big change coming. What was he thinking one minute before he saw the light on the road to Damascus. Yeah. He was thinking about killing people of the way, Terrible. persecuting them at, at the least. One minute later, his whole life got changed, yes. got turned around. And now he's a first church age messenger on his journey to apprehend, to get a hold of Christ, instead of apprehend Christians to put shackles on them yeah. and, and stone them to death and so forth. Uh, this is a marker on, uh, of, of, that should be very notable on the highway to glory. It's a display of benevolent mercy to show how great forgiveness is that Paul received of that forgiveness. There's so much that comes with that territory. Why do we read our Bible? In a short phrase, to know our God. 
to know what he says, for God is his word. And then there are many things attended to that. But we read our Bible to know our God. And he's the spirit of truth. He's the spirit of salvation that says, I am. Get a hold of his word and know him thereby. We've all heard the saying, and it's a compliment. If somebody says, uh, you know, this person or that person, they're as good as their word. It means they have a high opinion of them. Uh, they've found them to be trustworthy, that they follow through on what they say. Well, in Christ, not only is he as good as his word, he actually is his word. He is the spirit of truth. Amen. Who's shed his blood for us. He's the word that ever has been. And his gospel sayings are the vehicle by which we get to know him on a personal level. The sword in hand, amen, our sword, is the word of God. Uh, maybe you've seen this too. There, you know, there are many uh, Christian versus atheist debates on uh, YouTube and so forth. I was watching one of those. I've watched a number of them. Well, watching probably the most famous atheist of our time, where he critiqued Jesus' statement. It's found in Matthew 10, 24, which is, uh, it's the statement that says, Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Criticize that, you know, just taking it for a fleshly, carnal interpretation of it as a militaristic uh, saying. Now, of course, Isaiah 9, 6 proclaims this, that Jesus indeed would be the Prince of Peace. But Jesus, amen, I come to uh, bring a sword. Well, his sword's a little different than the ones of forged iron that they were using at the time of, of Christ. Amen. He wielded the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I've come to send a sword, and, and that does divide people. It'll make, it'll make half the household go one way. It'll make the other half go the other way. So it will, it will cause division in this world as to who God is. But that's the sword that he came to send among us, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. It's just, you know, that's, that's like the Pharisees who interpreted destroy this temple in three days I'll raise it up as being talking about the building there when he was talking about uh, the temple of his own body the world will interpret things in a lot of different ways and it just doesn't uh, measure up to the spirit of revelation so it, it'll cause division and it'll cause one to deny Christ but the same thing will cause another person to affirm Christ within their life and that's all done for a reason choices must be allowed but we thank God for his, his mercy Always have hope that a soul can stand, even if they don't confess Christ in this world, uh, that they stand before the throne and the fires of judgment will get you down to the point where the soul can be saved, but yet so as by fire, which I have a couple services dedicated to that uh, by title and, and so forth that probably be uh, uh, three, four weeks from now. But uh, just to refer to those things, God's mercy, it endures forever, and nothing shall be called impossible in him. Choices have to be allowed. For plainly, Jesus witnessed in Pilate's hall at the judgment hour. We're not talking about military swords. Jesus said plainly, my kingdom's not of this world. If it was, my servants would pick up the sword and fight. When Peter cut off the ear of Malchus, servant of the uh, high priest, uh, there would have been other swords to follow, and that would have started the rebellion right there. It, Christ came to wield the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And, that, and that's things like that. That's how badly those who don't know the gospel do not perceive the gospel. So we're set forth to know our God so we don't get caught up in carnal interpretations of the word and just take things in literal terms like others take them. So uh, the word of God is not bound. It's unbounded in its truth. And it takes a lifetime to see it all. And there's more to come on the other side even. As the word of God is not limited in any way in its revelation power. So it's full forward in Jesus' name. 
and to press toward the mark, to have a target in mind, make your way toward the goal. It requires effort, requires discipline. You gotta go against the grain of this world. You just, you have to. Salvation is an easy step, but per, uh, and it's a free gift. Perfect will faith is another thing. That takes, that takes effort. That takes dedication. It takes a little blood, sweat, and tears along the way. Uh, but there's no other way to practice the discipline that's born of faith in order to please God, because without faith, it's impossible to please God. So uh, there's no other way to show the, that quality other than uh, the trials that we go through in this world and the decisions we make as we press onward. And so, but that makes it this, even though there's hardness to it, even, even though it takes a discipline, even though it takes effort, you know, the trials of this life that afflict us, that we pray about, what they are are just opportunities to display real faith. God knows we need them. You know, we'd, we'd back out of the fiery trial of this life, I'm just talking about in this present world at the moment, uh, in this physical existence that we know now. We'd back out of the trials, given our choice, but God knows we need the experience. God knows that faith has to live by its actions. So he gives us these, and it, it, what they really are are opportunities to put crowns upon your head. And you're going to want those crowns. In the day of the casting of the crowns, when the 24 elders, Old Testament, New Testament witnesses of the faith, when they cast their crowns, represent our faith, we along with them. In the day that we cast our crowns at the Savior's feet, that's what they're for. Trials of this life, they'll seem so small in that day. It just has to be that way, and uh, the Almighty knows it. Let's turn to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Fundamental to the gospel is Paul's knowing that faith without works is dead, being alone. Well, I've got 18 minutes to get this service done. I'll see how close I can come. Lord, help me. Amen. Thank the Lord. If I go over a little, thank God the blood covers, covers me by forgiveness. Amen. Brother Ryan went over the time limit. Well, Lord will forgive him. Amen. I pray you will too. We'll see how good we can do. All right. So faith without works is dead, being alone. God knows this, so he created in order to make faith live. Not to be just in thought alone, only in concept, where it would be of no effect. Faith has to live. So God created life so that faith could live. How about that? There's a thought for you. And Paul, being determined to be, to be at Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost, which happens seven weeks after Passover, in Acts chapter 20 and from verse 22, says this, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem. The burden is upon his heart, goes willingly, but he's determined not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Now, in a general sense, he did. He didn't know specifically what all would happen. But, and doesn't know the things that shall fall, uh, befall me there. Uh, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide in me. You're going to go through things, but the Holy Ghost is there with you to comfort and edify and exhort and encourage, you know that, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now that is pressing on. I don't count any of it dear. But this one thing I do in order to apprehend or to reach toward the cross, to reach toward the Savior, I want to do this. I want to finish my course with joy Amen. and in the ministry. And uh, there are those that are helpful uh, guides there. The Spirit's guiding him always, but there are others there to help him, including Luke, the beloved physician who chronicled so much of the book of Acts. Uh, but it shows here 
in Paul's character that's built and born out of the belief that comes to him through mercy because, as we mentioned often, uh, in this service and many others, and the witnesses there continually, as Saul of Tarsus in his first life, he had persecuted the people of the way. So it's always of God's mercy and his revealing nature that we're not as Sodom and Gomorrah. God got Saul of Tarsus turned around, going the right way. That's God's mercy. So that mercy extends to all of us, Paul being an example of it. So give the Lord strength of praise for it's due him, which Paul, as an apostle now, he most certainly intends to do. No matter the consequence, because he's, he's got a pretty good idea of what lies ahead. He, he was once part of the persecution, and he knows it's out there, and in his case, doubly so, because he's number one on the hit list, uh, of those that uh, hate the gospel, but he forges ahead, and indeed, after many witnesses that finish out the book of Acts, at journey's end, Paul was martyred for the faith. And that's not recorded in scripture, it's part of church tradition, which I have no doubt is absolutely the case. He was martyred probably under Emperor Nero's persecution, general persecution of Christians there uh, right in, in and around the time of the, uh, the Christians were blamed for the burning down of Rome and, and so forth, all those things. Legend is that Paul was beheaded. I have no doubt that that is the case. But he pressed toward the mark and finished his course. And he didn't have any kind of death wish. He wanted to live just as much as anyone. But he, he was willing to carry forth on this course in order to obtain life and to obtain a better resurrection. And following verse 24, this, I'm not, I'm not going to read, I don't know if I could make it through without crying tears. It's one of the most poignant parts in scripture. You can read it uh, on your own or for yourself there in verse 36 through 38, which uh, through verse it leads up to chapter 21. It'll, it'll pull the heart right, you're, in symbolic terms, it'll pull the heart right out of you. Yeah, you know, it's so poignant is that time period when they, will see, they know they'll see his face no more. But he pressed toward the mark and finished the course, and you can just feel the emotion of it uh, off the printed page. All right, now, uh, point from all this, we're not all called to suffer martyrdom, but we are called to press toward the mark, and we're called to serve as the saints of God did in the pressing on. It takes determination, takes discipline. The disciples were called disciples because they were practicing a discipline, which is the root word of disciples. And uh, like as the master displayed dying for all, he held to the discipline of prophetic word, we must do so likewise on our path to glory. Let's turn to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, the great prophetic chapter, since we're pressing on. I want to include some of the prophetic content of the word of God that keeps us looking forward. And staying on the path to glory, it's, it's the way to see ahead. That way develops spiritual fortitude, builds courage, makes faith to live. It will all work together for good. If we love the Lord, <clears throat> excuse me, and hear the purpose of his calling, and that's good, such as good, the good that's been seen from the beginning. God created and that was good. God has seen what is good from the beginning. They're at the start of it all, even before the start of our physical universe. He'll see what's good at the end also, which, and here's, the, here's what I like about that. God will see uh, what's good at the end, and the end is, after all, a new beginning. So he sees the end of it all, but the end is a new beginning. So he's seeing it from the beginning. Uh, once again, 
A new day is dawning, a new, new age. So thank the Lord. World without end. This world ends. It's time for a better one anyway. The way that it ends up is a new beginning to us. That keeps us looking forward. And to press on, you need a vision, which Matthew 24, oh, it's got all kinds of forward vision to it. That, that is for certain. It's perilous times come. But in the end, thank the Lord, the glory will shine. All right. Matthew 24, verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. Speaking of Israel... Some critics say the fig tree, they only have one way to interpret scripture. It's represented by the olive tree. Depending on the content, content and context of the scripture, it can be. Here it's the fig tree. Jeremiah chapter 24, the kingdom of Judah and Israel was compared to a basket of figs. Some were good, some were so terrible, they couldn't even be, in, they were good for nothing, good for naught, couldn't even be eaten. And it was speaking of the whole nation plainly. All right, so learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation or this people shall not pass away. This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. As there you have the sounding of the trumpet. There, It was in verse 31 previous to what we read. Uh, the sound of the trumpet there which gathers the tribes of Israel, which further lends itself to the interpretation. All right. So what does it take to put all this in motion? It takes a voice, it takes a word written. That's how you win the victory. That's how Jesus did in the day of temptation. It is written. It takes a word from on high that thunders eventually, Revelation 10:3, as well as all the other elements of judgment contained in Matthew 24, in the seals and the vials and the prophetic trumpets, and they're, they're all in there. Just have to find them and search for them a bit. Jesus, here in, in Matthew 24, as he spoke of the signs of the times, he was looking ahead, just in the most basic element of faith. He was looking ahead at the furthering of uh, the realization that there are foundations. Daniel the prophet once saw this in the prophetic, his prophetic book, but now here it's even great, uh, shown in greater detail. And John the Revelator, he'll get even more upon the Isle of Patmos. So prophecy is always forward, it always has a forwardness of vision. That's, that's its, that can be a literal definition. Prophecy is forwardness of vision. It always looks ahead, always <clears throat> it's working. Pressing ahead toward the light of his coming that's set before us. Uh, and so the vision that God sees, because he who was and is and is to come, who sees all things all at once simultaneously, he's not bound by any restrictions. There are no boundaries that box the Almighty in. The vision of what is to be keeps us set on restoration, keeps us set on renewal which is the joy of the spiritual harvest. Harvest time is upon us. Shows in these signs as we learn the parable of young Israel or hear the parable of the fig tree. It keeps us going, but, but know this amidst all, and, and if you read Matthew 24, you better know this. You know that the same thing that was told uh, to John when he ate up the book of prophecy in Revelation 10, 9 and 10, the sweetness of the knowledge, oh, it, it's good when we sit here in church and we talk about these prophecies coming forth and we see it being displayed in the truth of Almighty God. It's wonderful. Build your spirit. Build your faith. Keeps you looking ahead. Keeps you pressing on. But you better know the other side of that spiritual coin, and the Bible makes no, no attempt to cover that up. In the belly, there's bitterness to it because of the terrible cataclysm 
and the calamity of the day is, is such as we're seeing now in the Israeli-Hamas war playing itself out, it's, it's, it's hard. There's just, it causes a lot of uh, grief and sorrow, causes a lot of angst and a, and a lot of vain imaginations, causes all these things to happen because of it. It's, it's terrible. It's terrible in its scope as it plays itself out. So you have to be prepared for that. God is getting you prepared. Be prepared like Paul was when he was determined to go up to Jerusalem, not knowing what fate was in front of him. Oh, he, I bet he could have got it within about five or six guesses what was going to happen. He didn't know specifically. It wasn't that detailed. But he knew, he knew in general what was going to happen. He, and, and knowing that, he could have chosen an easier way. But desiring a better resurrection, desiring to finish his course, he kept on pressing on. The choice was his. Praise Our choices are ours. Praise you, Jesus' choice was to face the cross. So this foreknowledge comes out of the greatest adversity ever. As when Jesus is saying all these things, he knows what it takes to make all this come true. He knows it's going to take a crucifixion. He knows that. But still he presses ahead. So if you want a better day, well, that's good and well. But you will... Or, or is prophetically the generation that's appointed here to see such days, uh, they will have to endure to the end, as, as will we. And it takes this type of warning, it takes the immediacy of the hour, the desperate need of the moment to get Israel's eyes open, even as it was in the days of their fathers when God heard their groanings as they labored under their burdens in building the treasure cities and the temples of ancient Egypt. And then they had to, uh, the Lord heard those groanings, got them out of the land of oppression. And then they had to hear the trumpet of that day, which what do trumpets do? They call the, uh, the assembly. They had to assemble together and they had to flee out of the reach of Pharaoh uh, to make it to the Red Sea or the Sea of Reeds, which is how most modern translations handle that phrase of in Hebrew, it's Yam Suf. Uh, he had to get them there to the water's edge where deliverance could come. So learn this parable. It's vitally important to know it and have it revealed. And it's important for Israel itself to take note of this when they hear the voice of God and they start searching these scriptures and they realize what Matthew 24 is. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. There will be some tears wept in that day. What a vision. It'll take that. Let the priests, priests and ministers of the law weep between the porch and the altar of the temple in Joel chapter 2 and verse 17. Symbolically or even actually, whether it's the synagogue or whatever it is, let, it's going to take a lot of weeping because deliverance is only going to come by divine intervention in these Matthew 24 days. Power of politics, political alliances, trust in human heads of government, it's all going to fall by the wayside. There's only one deliverance in this day. It's going to take the need of a desperate hour. So, uh, it's a time of harvest. So like in nature, the seed of the tree brings us to harvest. And this generation that's called upon to meet the challenge of the hour, it won't pass away till all is fulfilled. This people shall not pass away, or this generation shall not pass away. Let's turn to Hebrews, chapter 10. I've, you can put down in your notes in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 to 15. I'm, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm not going to read them directly. I'm going to go right to Hebrews chapter 10 because of uh, the lateness of the hour. But though these days are born out of great trial, this is what it takes to wake up those who are sleeping among the dead. We're all part of the battle of the battle to come, no matter who you are, what your occupation is, male, female, uh, young or old, uh, none of those things matter. We each have a part in this battle of the ages, either in the vision or in the prophetic reality or both. God and God's glory will get us through. 
It has to. It's going to have to get you through the trials, trials which are but opportunities to win crowns. All the trials of your life that you didn't want to go through, if you would take them out, it's like taking your crowns off, the things that you've gotten the victory over and displayed your faith. It's like throwing your rewards out the window. We need the trials, even though I, I, I don't think I've got the strength of character. I, I would have bowed out some of the trials of my life. I wish I didn't have to go through it. But if you can come through those things, if you can come through an illness, or you can come through a loss, you can come through a great trial and keep your faith intact, that's a crown on your head. Amen. That's your victory. It forges your character. So we have to exhort one another, encourage one another, which is what Hebrews 3 uh, tells us in verses 12 through 15. If you want to look those up on your own or just uh, refer to them or, or remember them uh, as we speak about them with the reminders from the pulpit. All right, but we're going to read out of Hebrews chapter 10. I just have a few scriptures to read there. Hebrews uh, chapter 10. Just take hold of the testimony of Jesus. Take a hold of the prophetic power that prevails against what? Against everything. It prevails against all the hellish gate. There's nothing the devil can throw at you that you can't overcome in Christ, who proved himself by making it all come to pass, who brings all spiritual vision to pass. And in Hebrews 10, and at verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. Oh, it's so new. It still is. It's the speaking blood. It's still the new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. That there, there, was only, there was a thin layer of human skin, and what was it covering? It was covering the Holy One of Israel. That was, it was like a veil. But uh, verse 22 says, Let us draw near with a true heart. Get close to the Almighty God. He, Almighty God he'll, he'll help us. And then in, uh, we're going to drop down to verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. There's the encouragement. Press on. Exhorting one another. You can find it also in Hebrews chapter 3 in the scriptures mentioned. Do that. Exhort one another. Yeah. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Yeah. The day of your personal destiny. The day of Matthew 24 destiny. That Jesus promised this generation shall not pass away to be until all be fulfilled. Because the day is approaching. In years of our measure, yes, it's been almost 2,000 years since that was given. But there had to be an immediacy to the language. It's a right now gospel because the word of God was responsible. That generation right there that was alive, that first saw the witness of John the Revelator written down, that heard the witness out of the book of Hebrews, it was for them just as much as it was given for us in order for them to keep up the good fight. And we've entered into their labors. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And it's written with a sense of urgency also for those of our own day, right in the right here and now. There has to be a sense of what is impending in order to get people's attention. Amen. Even for us who are on the other side of the church ages, and it's for all generations in between, according to the uh, eternal principles that are laid out in Scripture. So to see things anew, you got to see what's ahead, just like Abraham did. He, he rejoiced to see the day, saw it, and was glad. We have to have the oil of gladness in our hearts, too. We have to have the promise as we press on toward the kingdom of promise. And thus we do carry on to a kingdom which is to come and will never pass away. Amen. Let's stand in Jesus' name. I only transgressed by a few minutes. Lord will forgive me for that. Amen. Thank the Lord. I trust you all will too. Thank the Lord for his blessings. Amen. Well, you know what we got to sing. I'm pressing on toward that city where mansions are prepared for me. Thank the Lord for the place prepared. 
You know, God had a word prepared before Genesis 1-1. You know that? He thought about all this, put it all together. He had a word prepared, and then it was inspired and imparted to the prophets, holy men of God who moved as they were, uh, as they had an unction from the Holy One above. They wrote it out, and then once it got put to parchment, that became it is written, and that's when it becomes true. Amen. When it's conceived and thought upon and imparted and spoken and Thank then you. written, it's true right now. And God had all that prepared even from the very foundation of the world. Amen. As we bow our heads and as Sister Miriam plays through, we're going to press on in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for the courage and strength of character that comes from the word above, gives us the heart within to carry on, Father, gives us the discipline to close ranks and be soldiers for the cross. Father, how we thank you and bless your holy name for the encouragement that comes from above, that leads us on, knowing that all these things will be accomplished. They are accomplished right now in Jesus' name. Father, even as they unfold in terms of time, but Father, it's a finished work. It's finished from the beginning, from Alpha to Omega. The finishing word is in on it. Thank the Lord, and the victory will be won. So Lord, just bless us. Keep us pressing on in Jesus' name. Lead us from glory to glory for the furtherance of your name. And remembering those that have needs, Father God, many needs beset us, Father. Pray for those that are traveling now, for, for those that have trips scheduled, Father, to be able to uh, arrive and, and uh, come home safely. We thank you, Father, for being with us every step of the way. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen, amen. and amen. Thank well, thank the Lord for those that press on to that city where mansions are prepared for me. Yes, amen. Page 81 in the blue book. I'm, I'm pressing, pressing on, 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 I know I'm, I'm pressing, pressing on, 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 I know I'm pressing on, on to that city where mansions are prepared for me. Jesus knew what I needed the most when He filled my soul with the Holy Ghost. I'm pressing on to that city where mansions are prepared for me. I'm pressing on, 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 I know I'm pressing on, 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 I know I'm pressing on to that city. Prepared for me. Jesus knew what I needed the most when He filled my soul with the Holy Ghost. I'm pressing on to that city where mansions are prepared for me. I'm pressing on, on, on. I know I'm pressing on, on, on. I know I'm pressing on. To that city where mansions are prepared for me. Jesus knew what I needed the most when he filled my soul with the Holy Ghost. I'm pressing on to that city where mansions are prepared for me. I'm so glad. Thank the Lord. Jesus lifted me. 81. <laughs> I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. Singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me. Satan had me bound, but Jesus set me free. Satan had me bound, but Jesus set me free. Satan had me bound, but Jesus set me free. Singing glory, hallelujah, Jesus set me free. I'm so glad 
Jesus set me free. I'm so glad Jesus set me free. I'm so glad Jesus set me free. Singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus set me free. Satan had me bound, but Jesus set me free. Satan had me bound, but Jesus set me free. Satan had me bound, but Jesus set me free. Singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus set me free. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me. Singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me. It is by revelation.